Currently a timed PS5 exclusive, with it coming to PC eventually, Final Fantasy XVI makes an incredible first impression with its demo, allowing you to play the first two hours of the game, which does a fantastic job and enticing you the way it should. And having more demos like this is a trend I hope we see continue with other games, as it gives the player the chance to try a small slice of the game for themselves if they feel that reviews, trailers, and other news coverage simply just won't cut it. It shows you exactly what the game is like, and that 2 hour window is the perfect length for somebody to decide if this game is for them or not, to get a general sense of the vibe. So while you can't have any conclusive thoughts on it really, just being able to provide this is something that not a ton of publishers do these days, and is something worth commending. The opening hours of the game do a great job in setting up the plot and characters moving forward. Like any great one, it introduces some of our main characters and provides insight into their past that is the central pillar of their story. And so, as great and as impressive as it was playing the demo, it unfortunately did not carry out through the rest of the game. There sure were moments of high where I felt like they were really quite strong, enough for me to I think still recommend this game to the average gamer, but there were also a good number of lows sprinkled throughout that may not be as heavily criticized in the past perhaps, but definitely is not a highlight by today's standards, but we'll get into that in a moment. The voice acting and performances in this are actually really solid, and are better than most RPGs including previous installments for one key reason. This wasn't originally recorded in Japanese and dubbed in English. Instead, they decided to do the reverse. Yoshi P and the whole team at Creative Business 3 worked with actor Ben Starr to perfect the role and then worked on the Japanese translation afterwards. So that effectively means that the lip syncing was done in English rather than Japanese, which can really be the difference of feeling engaged versus getting accustomed to some more clunky dialogue that could be seen as part of the JRPG charm sometimes, depending on who you ask. But that also brings in some potentially familiar voices as well. Ralph Einstein voices Sid, who you may recognize with his iconic raspy voice. Clive doesn't have your nose. Harry Lloyd from Game of Thrones, and you may also recognize a few others from the Plague Tale games like Charlotte McBurney, Logan Hannon, and Anna Dimitriou. The game is a grand spectacle, and the world of Valisthea is gorgeous. I would say it is probably one of the most cinematic games I have ever played, and everything from the art design to the cinematography to environments and effects are all very visually pleasing to say the least. There are tons of boss fights that just look so epic and had me wishing that this were a movie I could see in IMAX. But packaging of any sort can only go so far. It can make for a great first impression, and first impressions are important, but that means nothing if the contents itself are not great. Luckily, Final Fantasy XVI manages to do both things, albeit not perfectly. And I want to be clear on this. I really enjoyed this game and I liked what it had to offer, but I can't say I loved it. Again, I want this to be very clear. This does not imply I hate it or even dislike it. I simply just don't love it the same way that a lot of people seem to. I only say this because I have seen a ton of discourse lately and some things get lost in translation. I also want to point out the reviews, like this one, are merely here to inform an opinion and to take and listen to different ones with grains of salt. And from there, draw your own conclusions. It definitely isn't the be all end all opinion. And with that, here are some areas I felt the game lacked. I have seen a ton of people compare this game to Devil May Cry, and it certainly is similar, especially since veteran designer Ryota Suzuki, who worked on Devil May Cry 5, worked on it. But something about the aesthetic, the side quests, and even the combat itself too, feels more akin to Dragon's Dogma, another game he worked on. And even more so to me, Near Replicant. Like Replicant, the semi-open world feels a tad bit barren in that there isn't a ton to explore except for encountering respawning enemies and completing a ton of menial side quests while also doing a dash after running for a while, though there are more hub worlds to explore here than in Replicant. Now I will say that the side quests aren't all menial, but the vast majority, at least in the first half of the game, I found to be and they feel really quite fetch questy. Unfortunately, there aren't a ton at that point, but the few you do unlock after a good number of main story quests don't feel that rewarding. Normally, these quests are there to provide a way of farming XP and having to grind it out a bit in order to meet a certain level requirement or recommendation for a particular story quest. But you don't have to worry about that here, because you likely will be at the exact level requirement you need to be at any given point, and sometimes even over leveled. Now again, I did say most of them feel menial. There were at least a few that were interesting enough to be rewarding on its own, with a couple of them actually being quite dark. And so, while I wouldn't recommend wasting your time doing too many of these, I do at least recommend playing the ones marked with a plus icon. And not icon as in your summons like Ifrit or Phoenix, but icon as in icon. Also, it is worth pointing out that even some of the regular side quests do get a bit more interesting in the latter half, and that there's a lot more of them. And in some ways, can be a little overwhelming, but they are also optional at the end of the day. 
But you know how I mentioned that first impressions matter? While the minor gripe here is that there are actually some good ones that improve on the characters and their relationship to Clive, because so many aren't in that first half, I feel as though many people will just dismiss this and not bother to organically feel the need to experience these without some form of word of mouth. I'm sure there's a good number of people who would just choose to ignore them, not feeling much motivation to do so. They also don't categorize them separately, so you likely would never know which ones feel more of a benefit than others without looking them up online, unlike games like Mass Effect where there's a clear distinction between loyalty missions and regular side ones. Of course, this isn't the same kind of RPG as Mass Effect, but you get the point. You are also granted some crafting items, and that system feels a bit shallow and really underused. A lot of the sort of RPG systems that you've come to know are also somewhat shallow too. Now I won't go to the extreme of saying that this isn't an RPG, because it still technically is, and the term's definition is pretty flexible encompassing various different types. But I think that the main criticism across most reviews is related to how simplified everything feels. The skill tree doesn't feel particularly comprehensive beyond the first time around. And the reason for this boils down to how little of a difference there is with each icon ability you have equipped. You are essentially just cycling through all six, and they vary little in different use cases. There's those that you might use to cover a greater area of enemies around you, and then there's those that you'll use to target a specific enemy. You can also use some to not only knock your targets back, but also spin them in the air. But that's about as wide as it goes. Thinking about how the different icons represent some of the different elements, you would think that one type would be more or less effective than another, depending on the enemy. They can all be used on any enemy no matter what. So swapping out some icons for others starts to feel ineffective because it doesn't really matter which one you're using, and because you get some of the abilities earlier on than others, you actually end up mastering some, rendering the newer ones kind of fruitless. Aside from this, at least I can say that the combat can be really fun, especially if you try experimenting with the different combos and play around with them in the training arenas. And personally, the default difficulty the game has to offer is more my speed. But this would not be much of a review if I didn't at least point this out. For people who are typically used to more of a challenge, you really aren't going to get that here. Sure, there are some cool enemies you can fight with various rankings by visiting the hunt board, but the overall difficulty doesn't have a lot to offer. Even as someone who can admittedly say probably sucks at video games compared to the average person, at times felt like it was on the easier end compared to other action games. And no, I didn't use any of the other items equipped like auto heal. Though again, let me be clear, I personally have no gripes with it, but it is strange that the harder difficulty setting can only be unlocked after beating the game once, instead of right from the get-go. So if you personally don't have an issue with it, why bring it up? Well, it is simply important to inform those who might be expecting more out of this. There is one part towards the end of the game, however, where the difficulty seems to somewhat spike a bit, but only so far, because that enemy in question on the surface seems like a bullet sponge, or an attack sponge I should say, but it definitely is more about patience and staggering, so I thought that one was actually really cool. Another thing I found kind of strange was just how late into the game you are able to expand your potion slots. It isn't a really big deal considering they are very abundant, but it irks me when a potion gets automatically used even when I have full health and don't need it, just because my slots are already full. But maybe that's just the hoarder in me. Usually I am one to defend games with cutscenes, with grand cinematics and such. In fact, those are the kinds of games I enjoy most. I love narrative adventures, most particularly a lot of PlayStation exclusives, but even for me, I felt as though the cutscenes were quite long and drawn out at times, and the balance between cutscene and gameplay felt skewed. And I know a lot of people will say that Final Fantasy has always had long cutscenes and point to screenshots of cutscene footage of previous entries on YouTube. But if we do the same here, the cutscenes seem to make about 20 hours of the game, a game that is supposedly about 35 hours in length on average. Of course, there are other side quests as I've mentioned you can do, and some exploring as well. When you're just looking strictly at the main story, which is the sole focus of the game, it is a lot. Now, don't get me wrong, the cutscenes are great, but it would be nice if there was a slightly more evened out balance between them. What I do appreciate, however, is the active time lore, which is essentially a small compendium of lore that explains a particular thing mentioned within the cutscene to catch you up to speed. Holding down on the D-pad pauses the scene and allows you to read a particular section about a character, or a people, or even just a term that they used in that moment. Without it, you likely will be lost for at least a significant portion, because while it is pretty easy to follow, they do use a lot of jargon. But in the event you do forget something and they haven't brought it up for a while, you can always take a gander at the Thousand Tomes back of the hideout, which constantly updates past ATL entries. 
Final Fantasy XVI presents a captivating and emotionally charged plot set in a visually stunning world. While it has its flaws, particularly in the side quests, RPG systems, and lacks the ability to carefully strike the balance between cutscenes and gameplay, it still remains an experience worth embarking upon. It is a perfect entry point into the series and the genre of ARPGs as a whole, as well as offering a rich narrative journey that will leave players yearning for more, even if it does have some pitfalls along the way that may either be seen as minor or major depending on your taste. And that is actually what the series has always been since it began. Regardless of how you feel about this one, there are always some in the franchise that will click for you, while some others simply will not. I know this was a bit of a divisive one, but I really appreciate you watching all the way through. But anyway, there are still a ton of new games to help round out the end of this year, so if you're interested in hearing about those too, consider subscribing. And while you're at it, if you want to check out some of my other reviews, click the playlist right here.